is going to be from 1 Corinthians 12, if you want to follow along with me. 1 Corinthians 12, starting at verse 1. We're always happy to buy you a Bible, by the way. Just let us know. We love buying Bibles. I will bankrupt the church to buy Bibles. 1 Corinthians 12, starting at verse 1. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given, through the Spirit, the utterance of wisdom. To another, the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. To another, faith, by the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of healings, by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discernment of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one body we were all baptized into one body. One spirit we were baptized into the one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, we were all made to drink of the one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the ear were to say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Apparently, every season of the Power Rangers is on Netflix. Yeah, every season. Just curious, just for a second, call it out. How many seasons do you think they made? Seven. Seven. Any? 15, 24, 21. 25, they're still making them. They're still, it's still going on. The original crew is gone. It's a young, hungry crowd defending the universe from evil these days. And it's possible you've missed the last 20 years of the Power Rangers. It's also possible you've never seen an episode ever, despite 25 years of running. So really, you're the ones who are making the mistake. And that's okay. I can give you every episode of the Power Rangers in about the next minute and a half. So this is what you need to know. It's a group of teenagers with attitude and inexplicable martial arts skills. <laughs> They've been recruited by an intergalactic being to defend the universe. They become the Power Rangers, not by choice, but by his choice. They all fight in monochromatic uniforms, red, blue, pink, that sort of thing. They get weapons and a new kind of power. And in addition to that, they can call on robot dinosaurs to defend the universe. <laughs> it's like something out of Shakespeare. It's great stuff. Every episode, I kid you not, every episode of the Power Rangers goes exactly like this. Ordinary teenage problems. Bullies. Fitting in. Boyfriends and drama. And then aliens attack. For no apparent reason and at any moment. They might be at the mall, they might be on a walk, they could be in the cafeteria at the school. Aliens show up and everyone just takes that in stride. The aliens don't arrive with weapons, they also know martial arts, and so the teens will fight with their martial arts skills for a while, they do pretty well, they're very good at what they do, but eventually they get tired, they don't work together very well, and then all of a sudden it will occur to one of them, it's morphing time. And then they put on the suits, and they have the weapons, and they start fighting evil, and it goes really well. They start to defeat evil handily. But then evil has kind of an ace up the sleeve. They recruit a giant monster. Always a giant monster, 
sometimes two. Always a big one, Godzilla sized, it starts rampaging through the city, indiscriminately knocking down buildings, doesn't care about the Power Rangers for some reason, and they will realize they need to call on the robot dinosaurs. The robot dinosaurs start to arrive, but they're not strong enough on their own. They're too disconnected from each other. And so, the Power Rangers will realize we have to combine them. And so one dinosaur will become an arm, one will become a leg, one will become the chest, one will become the head, one will become the sword, and they win. Every time. There were 60 episodes in the first season. <laughs> there have been 25 seasons. And it's every time. Every time. I was a middle schooler watching this and thinking, this is a rigidly formulaic show. How have they not by now understood they're superheroes? Why do they try the martial arts? Like, why wouldn't they immediately call in the robot dinosaurs? There's, why is there ever a doubt that they might lose? It's exactly the same every single time. 1 Corinthians 12, if Paul had known about Netflix and the Power Rangers, I promise you, we'd be hearing about robot dinosaurs right now. Absolutely. He is saying, do you understand that you are the body of Christ? Do you understand that you have access to a power that is beyond you, that you are not merely ordinary human beings, that you are not disconnected individuals, but that you have been brought into God's family, that you have access to riches and power and a community of people, that you are unstoppable, absolutely unstoppable if you work together because when you work together you become the body of Christ and the thing you need to hear from Paul very very clearly is this you need us we are a gift to you and we need you you are a gift to us and when we embrace the gift of each other we discover that God's spirit God's fullness can move in and through us because the body of Christ is unstoppable so Paul kicks off in verse 1 by saying very clearly, you probably don't understand the Spirit. I don't want you to be ignorant, brothers and sisters, about what it is to be spiritual. And the thing he says, brothers and sisters, is the kind of thing that we just move past really quickly, because it happens so often in the Bible, so often in the New Testament. He's always calling us brothers and sisters. We don't notice that that's actually kind of a profound idea. You are never once called readers. You are never once called Christians. You were never once called believers. You are always called beloved. You are always called brother. You are always called sister. Yo fam. That's what he's saying right here. Listen, we are a family. We are the body of Christ. That's what baptism is all about. It's not that you have made this decision for Jesus. It's that Jesus long ago made a decision for you. Long ago, he decided he was going to die for you. Long ago, he decided he was going to adopt you into his family. You were a part of God's family. Verse 18 says, he has decided to arrange the body together in this way. He has chosen the way the body is going to work. And sometimes we think, well, I've been baptized. I have this individual experience of my faith with God. I, I, I have this great relationship with Jesus, and I really don't need anybody else. Or I've got the mountains. They can be my church. I've got the beach. It can be my church. I can bring together some friends. We can have a cup of coffee. That could be a church. And there's some wisdom in that, honestly. The church is not a building, never has been. But the church is not something that we get to create for ourselves. The church is something that God gathers together. That's what communion is all about. A group of people who do not belong together, who might not choose to be friends with each other, who may have very little in common, scattered all across the city with different jobs, different ideas about life, different experiences of reality. All of these people get drawn together with Jesus at the center of the church. One loaf, one cup, one Lord, one Spirit. And suddenly we get sent back out as people who've been fed by God as missionaries to bring people back to this table. Every week that happens. Every week we get reminded of this amazing experience of God's family, drawn together, sent back out, drawn together, sent back out, a covenant community of people, the body of Christ. And it's crazy, absolutely crazy, that we believe in our time, because we live in America in the 21st century and we're a bunch of individuals, that, well, what I believe is true for me and what you believe is true for you. My experience of God is different from your experience of God, and you can do your thing and I can do my thing, and I don't really need to ask you for help, and you shouldn't really ask me for help. We're, you know, we don't really have anything to do with each other. That's not what the church is. That's never been what the church is. The church is thoroughly countercultural to the individualism of our time. It says, regardless of what you and I don't have in common, we have Jesus in common. That makes us brothers. That makes us brother and sister. 
That makes y'all family. That makes us family. That means there are people across the world who speak a very different language from us, who right now are worshiping the same Jesus, the same Spirit, the same Lord, and they are our brothers and sisters. I can't speak the same language as them. I may never have met them, but there will come a day we will all be gathered together as this great, rich family of God, this gift that we are to one another. You are a gift to me, but I am a gift to you. We are a gift to one another. You need us to experience the fullness of God's Spirit. Now, I know, again, that sounds really challenging. Isn't God the same to everyone all the time? Yes. Don't I have the full Jesus? Don't I have the full Holy Spirit? Yes, you absolutely do. But you have a limited perspective on the world, a limited perspective on reality. There's no avoiding that. And there's somebody next to you who is as different from you as an eye is from an ear. Completely different ways of experiencing the world, completely different shapes, completely different access to God. And those people may have a word of wisdom that you don't have. They may have an access to healing that you've never experienced. They may, have, they may have seen something in God and suffering that you've just you've never walked through. And if you disconnect from those people, you will be cheating yourselves out of something truly remarkable, the body of Christ, drawn together by the blood of Jesus, not just shed for sins, but blood that flows through our veins, that draws us together as different pieces of the body. You, he says, are the body of Christ. Not you, and not you, but you, y'all, are the body of Christ. You are an ankle, you probably a lung, you the spleen. I don't know, but we're all coming together, and we're all the body of Christ. And when we genuinely do come together, we become not just ourselves in a room, but something bigger than ourselves, something more than the sum of our parts, the body of Christ. And Christ is unstoppable. Christ is unstoppable. And that's a huge thing to realize. Because if I cut off my finger, you would refer to me as someone crippled, right? But you'd, the thing, you'd call the finger dead. If I were to cut off my arm, you'd say, wow, he's massively crippled. But you would refer to the arm as dead. This is the metaphor Paul chooses for us. The eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. And then that's actually true. That's not true. How will you pick up the cheeseburger you're looking at? How will you wave to the girl you find attractive? How will you play the Xbox? What will you do without the hand, I? Just because you say, I don't need you, doesn't mean that you don't need it. Imagine if the foot said, I'm out. I'm going to start a foot church. We're going to do foot things. We're going to listen to foot music. We're going to be tapping. It's going to be great. We don't need those head people out there with the theology. We're going to talk about foot issues in foot ways. We're going to do foot things. Yeah, it's going to be smelly, but we're all in this together. We are the foots, and we are incredible. That would be ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous, Paul says. This is the metaphor he keeps drawing on. You need me. I need you. We need each other. You are a gift to me, but I am a gift to you. The church is absolutely essential. There's this um, story about John F. Kennedy visiting NASA for the first time. And he's walking through, and you know, he's made that big thing. We're all going to land on the moon. He has no plan. And he's walking through the Space Center. He said, I, you know. And he, he walks up to a guy who's moving some stuff around. He looks like a janitor. He says, I'm Jack Kennedy. What do you do here? And the janitor says, I put people on the moon with absolute confidence. There's this little book we've been reading to my kids. It's about the seamstresses who sewed the spacesuits for the astronauts. They sewed them by hand. They sewed them with sewing machines. There was no engineering that could do a good enough job. It was little ladies in Texas just working a sewing machine over and over and over again. These people were watching as people landed on the moon, and they knew that they'd put them there. And they knew each stitch, and some of them were concerned that maybe they hadn't done the best possible work they could have done. And when Neil Armstrong started jumping, they all got very nervous. <laughs> no one knew that was going to, I, well, we did, yeah, I hope we did a good job. And then he, he said, it's one small step for man, one giant step for mankind. He knew that he was a representative of hundreds of thousands of people who had put him on the moon. He knew that he was not in this alone, that without quite a few people involved, he would be out in space, doomed. You need me, I need you, we need each other. We are a gift to one another. Some people, when they read 1 Corinthians 12, they think this is like a theological exercise and talking about whether or not the Spirit still gives people gifts. That's not what happens. 1 Corinthians 12 assumes that there are spiritual gifts and blows right past that issue. He's not even interested in convincing you. He's too busy saying, look, there are lots of different kinds of gifts, but there's one Spirit. There's lots of different kinds of manifestations of all that God can do, but there is one Lord. And the church, at its best, brings a whole bunch of people together who would never ordinarily operate together. 
Jews, Greeks, slaves, free, men, women, old, young, black, white, poor, rich, doesn't matter. All together. Now, if you're in the world that we live in today, it is safe to say that we are thoroughly divided from one another. I could tell you right now, based on the news program you would enjoy, what your political party is. I could tell you what your opinions on guns are. I could tell you what you think about masks and those who wear them or those who don't. I could tell you your thoughts on racial reconciliation. I could tell you your thoughts on the word social justice. I could tell you your thoughts on science, your thoughts on immigration. Now, that's disconcerting, but that's also normal. That's called tribalism. That's alive and well throughout the world and always has been. And people say America shouldn't be like that. America's never been like that. America's always been like that. It just has. The church shouldn't be like that because the church is about something completely different. The church is about this brand new creation, this brand new kind of humanity that draws together people who do not ordinarily belong together. The most countercultural thing about the church in the first century wasn't just that they worship Jesus, is that there were Greeks and Jews sitting next to each other and eating together. That made no sense. That never happens. It's like Republicans and Democrats saying, we're best friends. What do you mean? You're, I've seen the news. You're not best friends. This really strange thing that happens where you become a gift to me and I become a gift to you, where we begin to realize that we are very different from each other, the way a finger is from the small intestine. But the finger knows the small intestine is important, and the small intestine knows that the finger is extremely important. Without you, I don't get food. Without you, the food doesn't matter. We're wildly different, but we are intimately connected. And when we become intimately connected, we start to realize that you have gifts that I don't have, that I have gifts that you don't have. And little by little, we become the body of Christ. Little by little, we have this power moving through us in the world. And it's amazing. And it's unstoppable. There was this friend of mine many years ago who she and I would chat. And she's a delightful person and a really gifted evangelist. And so we would sit and she'd say, I just, I, I don't like the local church. They're no good at evangelism. I'm really good at evangelism. And I, I just can't find a church that's good at evangelism, so I'm not going to go. I'm going to be an evangelist here, and I'm, you know, whenever I find a church like that, that's the church I'd go to. And I would say, you know what, you are a great evangelist, and honestly, like you, you always teach me a lot of things. But the truth is, as long as you say that, there are lots of churches that won't be good at evangelism, because you won't be a part of them. Don't you realize they need you and they need your gifts? Don't you realize that the holy you see in the church might actually be you? That you're like, that thing needs an earlobe. I'm an earlobe. I would, why, why aren't there more room for... Well, that's because people like me need to be involved in the local church, that maybe God is calling us in this way. There's a pastor friend I know who talks about... Um, uh, his name is Albert Tate. He talks about what happens uh, when the body stops working together. You and I know exactly what that feels like when you get the flu. Right? A body part just says, I'm out. The nose, usually. I quit. I'm just, I'm all done breathing. Mouth, that's your problem now. I'm done. <laughs> And also, by the way, not only am I full of things, I'm also draining constantly. How can you be both full and constantly losing stuff? I don't know, I quit. That's your problem, hands. Go find some Kleenex. And then the ears say, I'm out too. And people say, what? And you're like, I'm out too. I can't hear. I'm out too. I'm done. And then the bowels, they quit too. And then just the people who walk away, they just open all the valves and they say, good luck. 48 hours? Who knows where things are going? And then your muscles, they say, I'm done. And they don't really quit, they just sort of whine because no one else is helping and I don't want to do anything else ever again. Now, if that happens to the physical body, imagine what happens when the spiritual body doesn't work together the way it's supposed to. Imagine what happens if the parts don't work together the way they're supposed to, if they don't see the value in one another. You will never experience the fullness of God's Spirit, never, without the body of Christ, without sitting alongside some other people who are deeply sinful, extremely broken, extremely flawed, and asking them what God might be saying through them to you what God might be doing through them in the church, how we might all operate together. The eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. The foot can't say to the head, I don't need you. Just because somebody says I'm not a part of this doesn't actually make them not a part of this. There's no avoiding being a part of the body of, the body of Christ. You're just a functional member or one that's not really pulling its weight. Uh, I need you exactly as much as you need me. We need you, really. The church sees you as a gift. We need your help. This is absolutely something Paul would say to the church in Corinth. We are desperate for your gifts. Desperate for your gifts. Just because you think your gifts are small or you're not that necessary does not mean that you're actually small or not that necessary. At, at some level, if the ear says, well, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong in the body, or if the foot says, because I'm not a hand, I'm not a part of the body, that doesn't make it any less necessary to the proper functioning of a body. There's a writer named Joni Erickson Tata, 
who uh, my mom loved and who I got hooked on uh, a long, long time ago. And she talks about what happened after the Oklahoma City bombing, and she was invited to do some uh, counseling with some people. And so she showed up and says, I, upon arrival, I had to go to the Red Cross Center to be cleared and credentialed. I'll never forget wheeling into that low, flat, red brick building. There were people setting up chairs and tables, stacking forms, putting out donuts and coffee. The thing you need to know, Joni is a quadriplegic. She can't do any of those things. She can't set up chairs, she can't put out donuts, she can't do any of those things. And across the large room was a tall, official-looking woman in a white lab coat. When she saw me wheel through the door, she quickly turned through a clipboard and pulled down her glasses and said, Oh, I'm so glad that you're here. Why? I said. That sparked my curiosity. She responded, When people walk up to you in your wheelchair and see that you handle your personal crisis with that smile of yours, it speaks volumes to them. It assures them that they can handle their crisis too. We need people like you in here. Please help us go out and find more individuals like you who can assist us. Immediately I got this picture in my mind. Wouldn't it be great on any given Sunday morning to see people with white canes, wheelchairs, and walkers come through the doors of our sanctuaries? And wouldn't it be something if we all turned around in our seats and our congregations and exclaimed, oh, we're so glad you're here. We need people like you in our church. We need people like you in our church. Every single one of you. And this is obvious if you're around Midtown for very long. The truth is you're definitely going to be asked to do something. You'll definitely notice people putting away chairs. It's an obvious thing in a smaller church like ours. But it's true really in any church. If you've been to bigger ones and sat in the back of the room, if you watched great speakers and, and just walked up and there were cookies set out and there were chairs set up for you and you don't realize there were people showing up two hours before church, there were people sticking around two hours after church, there were people running a sound system, there were people who laid cables, there were people who were practicing all week on the piano. There are people who are constantly working so that when you show up to church, you will feel welcome. You'll feel a part of the family. It's a beautiful thing. But it also means that the more you show up in environments like that, the more they're going to need your hands, your feet, your eyes, your ears, your body, your gifts. Because you have gifts that I don't have. I have gifts that you don't have. You're essential to the proper functioning of a body. And the truth is, in any church of any size, there's always this smaller group of volunteers that are rigidly committed to making sure that people who come will feel welcome and at home. And you might be sitting here and saying, look, I, I don't, there's nothing, I, like, I certainly don't want to be preaching. I definitely don't want to be at the front of the room. I don't have any, like, I can't play a keyboard. I don't, I don't have any singing voice. I got nothing. There are people who show up to this church who are just happy to fold up chairs every week. There are people who sit out there who are happy to welcome people every week. You might say, look, I don't have much. I'm just, I like, I like having people over to my house. I make a, a decent pot roast. Great. I love to eat. People would love to have you into their house. They would love to be in your house. You might have the gift of hospitality. You might have a gift, honestly, of deep wisdom. You might be a person who prays amazingly well and can invite people into a faith that you have that honestly for some of us doesn't make sense. You might be here and you might be thinking, I'm not even sure I believe in Jesus. Great, we need you and we need your doubt. When you show up to Bible studies, you're incredibly helpful to us. You remind us, actually, of the reason we believe these things. And you help us to learn to articulate it in a way that makes sense. We need you. It doesn't matter how small you think your gifts are. It doesn't matter how giftless you, you think you might be. You might think, I'm a little too old to be useful in a church like this. Look around, we need old people. You might be looking around and thinking, I'm, I just, you know, I don't really know that I, I'm, I don't really know that I have anything to offer a church like this. I promise you, we absolutely need people like you in a church like this. You might think, I'm just good with spreadsheets. I'm just good with numbers. That's all I know how to do. We need people who are good with spreadsheets. We need people who are good with numbers. Most of us are really, really bad at those things. The amazing thing about this church, there are people who give in this church who tithe. They give 10% of their income. It's incredibly helpful. Without you, we don't pay bills. Without you, we don't pay our staff. Without you, we can't bless Hope Women's Center, which is the space in which we meet on a regular basis. Without you, when the pandemic hit and people were suddenly out of work, we couldn't feed people who were suddenly out of work because that happened in this community. I love bragging about you to you. It is one of my favorite things in the world. I had people who were sneakily emailing me and saying, I want to pay somebody's rent. I want to pay somebody's mortgage. They just can't know about it. And then I'd have people say, hey, pray for me. I need some, some miracle from God to pay my rent or my mortgage. And I'd say, oh, that had already happened. And they'd go, what do you mean? I, go, I can't tell you about it, but if you, we can pay your mortgage. No problem. It was an amazing thing to watch the church be the church, an amazing thing to watch the church be gifts to one another. We need you. You need us to experience the fullness of the power of God. Each and every body part working together for the kingdom. 
The church is not an event that we attend on a Sunday morning. It's not. It's not something I show up to when I see. It's not something I can get in podcast form. It is not something that happens on Spotify when I'm on a hike. That's not what the church is. The church is a gathered community of people. And by the way, those of you who are joining online, you are a part of our church. We know that you're a part of our church. And you know better than most, actually, that if someone's not sitting at a streaming booth back there, you don't get to go to church. That if someone's not figuring out a sound system for you, you don't get to go to church. And we know the ways that you're choosing to be invested and involved in this community. The church is not a spectator sport. It's a community of people on mission for the gospel. It's the body of Christ drawn together, doing amazing work for the kingdom. And all the more amazing because it's a group of sinners. All the more impressive because there's nothing impressive about us. One of the worst things about the church is the humans in the church. And, and you know, right? If you've ever been to a church and you sat there and you're like, so this is, this is, okay, this is not as great as I thought it was going to be. You know? And you're looking around and you're thinking, I could, I could do better than this group of people. And then you try another church and you go, I could do better than this group. And you try another and you're like, oh, I see. The hardest thing about the church is that it's full of people. If it was just about Jesus, that'd be so much easier. And it turns out that Jesus likes to use people like you and like me. Really broken, really messy, really dark people like me. God uses people like me, and it's shocking. It makes no sense at all. And the more you get to know me, the more you'll go, wow, it is amazing that God chooses to use people like you. <laughs> Believe me. Ask my wife, ask my children, ask people who are related to me. I'm very difficult to deal with. And inexplicably, God has chosen me on a regular basis to talk to a group of people about what the Bible has to say. Because I have this gift. And I don't really know why, but it's a gift. I can tell you the first time I ever preached a sermon, this is real. First time I ever preached a sermon, I was working at a Presbyterian church to make money. That's it. That was the whole thing. And I didn't really have a plan, and I didn't really want to work for the church. And there was this day we had to do a youth Sunday. So we had to bring all of the kids and put the kids in front of the church because the kids are actually a part of the church. And they were going to run the church, and there was one of them was supposed to preach a sermon, and he got cold feet on Saturday. And so there was just no sermon. He got scared, and he wasn't going to come. And so I thought, okay, well, that's, that, okay, I don't know what we're going to do, and I guess it's going to be me. And so I decided to talk about the prodigal son. That was it. And so I stood up, and I talked about the prodigal son, and somewhere in the midst of that, I thought, oh, this is what spiritual gifts are like. It was an amazing thing, honestly, an amazing thing. It is an amazing thing. If you start to figure out how God has gifted you, you see some of these people play in worship on a regular basis. If you start to see how God has gifted them and you encourage them in their gift, it's a wonderful thing. But what they'll tell you is, it's a gift. This isn't something I did. This is something God gave me. When Paul is talking to the Corinthian church, verse 1, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant about this. The word ignorant there is a kind of a touchy one for them. All throughout this book, we've been talking about knowledge. We've been talking about how to get better. We've been talking about how their knowledge tends to puff them up. How it tends to make them arrogant and feel like they don't need anybody else. He's been talking about spirituality because they talk a lot about spirituality. They've been given these gifts and they don't need anybody else. They've sort of advanced. They don't need to be a part of the church. They don't need this group of people, this messy group of sinners, because they've become saints. He goes, that is not a sign of maturity in you. That is a sign of deep ignorance. That is a sign of massive immaturity because you don't realize that you are in desperate need of the body of Christ. And one of the things about the body of Christ, it can help you discover your gifts. It can help you really come alive in what the Spirit has called you to do. And by the way, God really does amazing and miraculous things. That list of gifts is not exhaustive. God does heal people today. God does speak in strange and mysterious ways. God does give people visions and dreams. God does, by the way, help some people be incredibly organized, which doesn't sound supernatural until you're not organized, and you go, that is a gift. Oh, my God. <laughs> Look at those people with their spreadsheets and their lists. They're amazing, these people. God has really given them this incredible spiritual gift. Some people are gifted to serve. Some people are gifted in amazing ways. And you might not know what your gift is. You may not actually think that God has given you that gift. I promise you he has. I promise you, God has given you at least one, if not many, gifts. We have little spiritual gift things that help people figure stuff out. Let us know if you want help with that. But one of the things that will happen when you start to discover how God has wired you, what God has built you to do, you just feel like this, this power of God suddenly begins to move through you. When you really start to fulfill your role in the body of Christ, the power of God really seems to move through you. The word that Paul regularly uses for these gifts is... Uh, charismata. So basically just a gift that's been given. It's a very unusual word for something really spiritual. It's really just this is a grace of God moving in and through you. But the other word he likes to use is dunamis, which is a Greek word and it means power. And it's a really interesting word that just gets used periodically. That what happens when somebody, just an ordinary person, gets connected to the Spirit of God, which happens in the church, gets connected to the Spirit of God, gets connected to the body of Christ, and suddenly they come alive. It's like people are just walking around like little barrels of gunpowder, just waiting for a spark to set them off. 
There was a chemist in 1867 named Alfred Nobel, who is kind of famous. You've probably heard of the Nobel Prize. And Alfred Nobel, in 1867, took three really ordinary things. Nitrogen, which you find in the air, glycerin, which you find in food, and dust. And he figured out how to combine those three things into a stick about this size that was incredibly powerful. Three things that didn't seem remotely powerful suddenly brought together became incredibly powerful as long as there was a spark. He called it by a Greek word, dynamite. He chose the Greek word dunamis, power, and he went with dynamite. This is a word you know because you've seen it in many a Bugs Bunny cartoon. This word is incredibly powerful because it's connected to something that's incredibly powerful. In its time, no one had seen anything like this. Nitroglycerin was incredibly unstable. Gunpowder was powerful, but not nearly as powerful as this. But this thing, when all of those elements combined in just the right way, and when there was a spark, when there was a power that came from outside of it, suddenly, power was unleashed. Mountains could be moved. Miraculous things could take place. That's what happens. That's what happens when ordinary people come together in the body of Christ. When ordinary people get connected to the Spirit of God, there is a spark and power is unleashed. You need me, and I need you, we need each other, to really experience the power of the Spirit of God moving in and through us. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus.